and, and just focus on the board. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so now it is recording. Awesome. Uh, let me just open my screen up a little bit more. Um, okay, so... Uh, so the first game was actually a Blitz game. <laughs> Karyakin just got crushed. This is one of my favorite games of, like, recent times. Yeah. Um, and I noticed now what you're saying, like, I, I mean, I kind of got it when you said it, but now I kind of get it. Like, when you want to attack, like, you have to make sure your pieces are, like, you have enough amu- ammunition, right? Um, here right. It's also about, <laughs> yeah, it's also about realizing, like, White's pieces are out of play on the, the king side, too. Ah. So sometimes it's about recognizing the factors, which will lead you to perhaps finding uh, finding the right attacking resources. But yeah. yeah, in this case, black is so much more well prepared to attack than white is to defend. Yeah, and then I, I guess I don't have any question on this game, but I was just so impressed at this game, and especially move twenty two, this queen b three move. Like I was like I was trying to figure out a way to break through, but I just couldn't find it. And, I guess he saw this like ten moves ago, and I was like, "Oh man." <laughs> yeah, it's a hard move to spot. I, I I don't know if he would have seen this move when he played c4, but this is one of, uh, and especially because this was a blitz game, this was oh, a lot sure. about flow, with the idea that, especially after c4 is played, there's so much flow with bishop a3, knight c5, pawn d3, knight d4. So it really um. Mm. It, this first move, pawn c4, facilitated the rest of the pieces coming into play. And it was very well worth the, the pawn sacrifice. Mm. Um, but yeah, a lot of these moves, like, after c4, a lot of the moves were natural, until queen b3. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I like d3 a lot. Um, I think that's, in the terms of, like, flow, like, it makes so much sense, but it wouldn't stick out, you know, sacrificing another pawn. Um, right. To keep to keep things going, but you, I've noticed like they they clear the c4 square for this knight. You clear the d5 d4. I mean c5 and d4 square for this knight. It, it's I I that's like so resourceful. I love it. Yeah, um, and this is actually a major theme in this game, and I think the other game between it was Shabal of Kakashvili, yeah, where pawn sacrifices were made uh, for clearance. Mm. which is not always a reason why you would sacrifice a pawn, but in these cases, it was either to open up lines for your pieces or, or to open up the square in this case. And the yeah. g4 square was more valuable than having the pawn there. I'd rather have the knight there. So good. So good. Yeah, um, yeah beautiful attack. I love this game a lot. Yeah, I like this game too. Yeah, it's a game for the ages. <laughs> so. Yeah. And then, and then, then I shared the, um, oh, go ahead. the Shabala game. Which one? Uh, this, this next one, chapter two. My my defeat against oh. Shabalov was pretty painful. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm curious because like here, it it looks like you know black could still be okay. Um, and then you took the G2 pawn, clear, opening up some lot, like opening up the file and um, being a little more dangerous. Right. Um, I'm curious if you did not take this pawn. Like, what would Black's game plan be? Yeah, I think it's it's actually already a difficult position for Black. <laughs> because uh, of this? I remember talking to Shabalov after the game, and he told me that this line was very dangerous, and that I should probably choose a different variation, even going back to, like, sure. this moment. Where he, he told me I should take with a pawn, rather than the queen. Oh. Uh, to go for this d5 break. Yeah. Because the structure that I got, like, white is so much more in position to attack. And the problem is white is threatening to play f6. Yeah. So I want to, um, I would like to somehow deal with that. But if I play f6 myself, uh, maybe it's a candidate move, but it's, at the same time, it's weakening. It also gives white um, a, a pawn break possibility, a simple plan of g4, g5, and rook g1. Yeah. So even if I don't take the g-pawn right away, the g-file is still probably going to open, and white's going to have resources no matter what I do. Yeah, huh. Maybe... Maybe bishop... I could go for b4, but... Ah, uh, bishop d4... Well, bishop d4 uh, leaves the knight undefended, unfortunately. Ah, uh, maybe... Uh, shoot, I gotta... <laughs> you gotta... So many moves, right? Looking at the yeah, so... So rookie, yeah. yeah. The the thing is, I would like 
perhaps a few moves in a row, like bishop d4 and then rook e8. Mm. Um, but I'm I'm a little out of play here, or out, like um, just not well positioned to defend everything at once. Uh, if rook e8 immediately f6 happens, yeah, I don't think there's any great discoveries. Now the yeah. rook is and the bishop are coming to life. Oh man, that's scary. It's it's all started from move seven too, and, and you know Shabalov. Is, is that how you pronounce it, Shabalov? Yeah, Shabalov. Yeah. He knew it from move seven. Like, oh, yeah, this line is very dangerous. And right. Yeah. Wow. Well, actually, the the unfortunate thing about this game um, was this was my second time playing Shabalov, mm -hmm. and I went into the same opening variation. Oh. The first time I played him, I went into a very similar line. And he beat me in a very similar fashion. Mm. So it was um, it was sort of deja vu. I'll I'll have to try and find the other game too. Sure. Because uh, I know uh, the games are actually very similar, and that <laughs> would be another game to show how to uh, carry through with the attack. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this game is also great. Um, there was, yeah, it's just like so much pressure, and there's you know, Black's King is like very. Oh, White's King is not touched right now. <laughs> right. Which is crazy. Um, well, I think that just to highlight one thing about the way Shabalov executed the attack, mm -hmm. which I think is very important to pay attention to, is um, the importance of these uh, these kind of slow but restrictive moves. Like H3 was a really important move that is not easy to find when you're, when you're doing guess the move because you're thinking about attacking. But H3 was very useful in the sense that I'm, he's not allowing queen take h2. Yeah. And um, now my queen is a bit more misplaced, and rook g1 is coming. Yeah, yeah. And I was I was looking at a line of, like, right when you move this bishop out of the way, you know, um, this square mm -hmm. is open. So, right. like, what did you, like, went back? Oh, actually, whoops. I think I had a line where you went backwards after h3. But, yeah, I think I was just kind of playing around with the lines, but... Um, uh -huh. Very, very beautiful attack, and H three. I didn't find that at all. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um. Well, the reason why I moved my bishop backwards was to threaten queen take H two and to try and slow him down. Yeah. Um, because I, I I knew that if if the H file opens, I'm controlling H one, so he would have a harder time accessing it, and yep. I wanted to initiate some queen trade because he's the one attacking. Yeah. But. Yeah, he did a very good job of keeping queens on the board. This is another reason for rook g4. Mm. Which, um, yeah, he, okay, he's threatening to double rooks, but he's more importantly avoiding the queen trade. Mm. Which is so important for positions like this when you're the one attacking, like, white's, like, gem is to keep queens on the board. And especially because my queen is misplaced, it yeah. just makes life so much more difficult. That's clever. And then so, once you got your rook off the back rank, he just went in for the sacrifice. Yeah, which I completely, I completely missed during the game. Um, I probably should have seen because this this idea of queen e8 is um, is begging to be played, mm. and like all all the like variations work out for white. Now, did you find rook take g7? Uh not my first move. I I don't think I found it. I think I went too fast. Gotcha. Uh, I actually doubled rooks, but this works perfectly. Yeah, rook take g7 is, is just a lot more forcing. Um, if doubling rooks, that might also be very strong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I would do. Oh, maybe I would take on f5. Like, I, I'm threatening the f-pawn. Oh, and then bishop so that was a point of rook c5. Hmm, I see. There is also some crazy line. Oh, it probably doesn't work. I was thinking if rook g1 to play g5. Yeah. Because if on passant, like he can't on passant because then queen. I win the queen. Yeah. <laughs> like both pawns would disappear uh, uh, um, on the fifth rank after the after the pawn capture. But I think bishop take g5 here is um, <laughs> crushing. Yeah, a lot of moves look scary. And h4, yeah. <laughs> Oh, but, um, yeah, sometimes when it comes to attacking, at some point you just want to be concrete. And if you have a forcing move, you want to calculate it until 
until yeah. potentially it's just a forced win. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, yeah, this is quite common or a common approach, approach. And just forcing moves, forcing move. And then uh, there's no defense, unfortunately for me. Just yeah. Pawn pick. And the beautiful thing about this was like his queen is hanging here. Oh yeah. yeah I saw that too, <laughs> but I can't take it. I know. If I take it, the, like he has this rook g8 mate in the end. Yeah. That's crazy. And I remember, um, like the first game I played him, he had a very similar sort of mating idea with like this control over the G file. Really have to find that game. It was also a beautiful mate. Um, so I tried bishop f4 and then I took his queen and I let him mate me because, okay. Um, as far as, uh, as far as my etiquette goes, if my opponent sacrifices a queen for mates, I let them play it out. <laughs> so. Oh, fantastic. That's good. Uh, so yeah, tough game. Um, then, but like, I, I learned a lot from this game in terms of how, like, how he attacks. And Shabalov especially has a very, like, aggressive attacking style, which is, like, if you're looking to, like, play more aggressively, then I would suggest looking at more of his games. Yeah, I actually have, I actually didn't realize he was also in this game too. Um, yeah. But yeah, like stuff like this, you know, like. Yeah, D five is hard to find. Like, there's two pawns. Like that's like the worst move you can do, I think. But you know, you find square. You know, you make room for your knight and. Yeah, it was all about clearing the D four square and like whatever pawn black takes back with it creates some more some sort of weakness. Like if C captures. On d5, then there's bishop b5. Yeah. And this is actually a thematic thing. Like, this is one of the first things you should look for. If your opponent's king is in the center and you're castled, then you want to look for ways to open the center. d5 is a very extreme way to do so, but it's very effective here. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, all his pieces are... <laughs> and there's a rook on the seventh, you know? It's pretty nuts. Right. And, okay, black's up a pawn, so... <laughs> like, sometimes this is how grandmasters will play. Like, they'll grab a pawn and they'll try and survive. Yeah. And then it's up to the opponent to kind of make use of their temporary initiative. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it, um, it, it turned out to be very strong for white. Um, very nice. I apologize for the dog barking in the background. Oh, you're fine. Yeah. All right. Awesome. I would love to see any new games or any, any new lessons around middle game strategy that you have prepared or. Yeah, there's a few games I thought we could walk through um, between this study and um, the the middle game strategy study. Mm. I just thought of a another game because I was talking about like these concrete sacrifices, mm -hmm. um, very similar to this this rook take g seven move in the Shabalov game. Yeah. So I thought maybe I can give you some exercise and also should show you like a nice opening uh, opening preparation too. Let's do uh, it. A new board. By the way, I've been playing the Four Knights with A3. <laughs> so ah, yeah, I saw one of your games um, recently. Oh, you did? Where what? it worked out, um, well, one of your online games on Lee Chess. Oh, nice. Within the last few days. And like the center fork trick, the guy played bishop c5, you took on e5, you got a great position, and yeah. then you plundered your queen at some point. You played queen <laughs> And that was really sad. Oh, I'm sad you saw that. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, you saw my game. Uh oh, I, I <laughs> Um, but no, the opening prep was great. Oh, I remember that game. Yeah, yeah. I was up, I was up a pawn and then I, the pin on the, my, my king, right? I remember. Yeah. Um, it was against a student. It was a, yeah. it was casual rapid, but, um. Yeah, that was my friend. Um, oh, okay. The same friend, if you remember a long time ago, of like I was playing against in the video. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, no, I yeah. remember that because the name sounded familiar. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, actually, you you played the opening very well because he went into a, a tricky line. Uh, after you took on e5, he castled. Mm -hmm. And then you you played h3 at like the the right moment, which mm -hmm. is very strong. Because if you don't yeah. play h3, sometimes you run into knight g4. Yeah, yeah. I saw some master game play like bishop e2 and the computer likes h3. I think they both work. Mm -hmm. Just to g4. Nice. So, okay, I'll show you a game that perhaps you could walk into, or like perhaps this opening could apply to you. I, I've noticed you've been playing Benoni. 
Recently. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've been trying new play? things out. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what would you play against Bishop F4 here? I'm just curious. I watched your lecture on games you know by heart against D4. Ah, uh, so you, okay. I was going to show you one moment like, from that, uh, from like that this. lecture. Something like this. So did you see the Jennifer Yu game against Cherevich? I mean, I watched it a while ago, so I would okay. love for you to show me, like, um. Yeah, I just wanted to show, like, one nice, um, nice way to attack. And yeah, D4, D5 and C5 are, like, probably my, my recommended moves here. Um, you could start with C5. If white plays D5, then it's a Benoni where the bishop, in some cases, could be a little bit misplaced on F4. Oh, that's, that's not a bad idea, actually. Um, yeah, so most players will play E3 here, like E3 or C3. Mm. Um, yeah. Let's say E3. That and this sense. is where I recommend just playing D5. Just, like, grab um, grab a bit more space. Yeah. And the idea, if white allows you to do so, you would like to play queen b6 and knight c6. Mm-hmm. Or knight c6 and then queen b6. Mm. So, um, actually, before I show you the Jennifer Yu Shiravich game, I'll show you uh, like a really nice line that a lot of players will walk into. Sure. Um, where they're, they might not be familiar with the, the opening details. So let's say white plays knight f3. Sure. You play knight c6, c3. Um, if you're playing against a London player and you reach this position, you're already in very good shape. And mm-hmm. Black has, um, like, with Black's next move, you're um, you're already seizing some initiative, and, and objectively, you probably already have a slight advantage after Queen B6. Yeah. Because you're targeting the, the one thing in White's position, which is not defended. Mm-hmm. Now, here, White will usually play Queen to B3. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's some tension because you don't want to take on b3 because white would uh, happily take back and have the open a file. Um, yeah. Vice versa, you, white you doesn't really take on b6. Yeah. Because then you take back. So do you know the the right move here for uh, for black? Yeah, c4. Now, does this line look familiar? Like you've seen this before? I I saw you do a lecture on this. I think. But okay. It just comes from memory, like, I, I don't, oh, yeah, yeah, it was like a, while, a long while ago. Gotcha. Um, so I'm going to show you a game which I didn't show in the lecture, which is a game I discovered uh, not too long ago, and it shows some, like, really nice middle game strategy Okay. after the queens got traded. So let's say white takes. You take back, and give me one sec, I'm going to try and find the game real quick. Um, there we go. Okay. So white will play knight d2. Um, and the reason why black is better here is simply more space on the queen side, um, ideas of b5, b4. And in the long term, like in later stages of the middle game, black is going to create some weakness in, in white structure on the queen side. Combining the the open uh, or the half open a file, the fact that black can play bishop f5, white can't play bishop d3, mm-hmm. so there's already some issues for white. Sure. Now um, black can start with b5 here. Oh wow, you do that right away. Do it right away. I mean, you have ideas of already playing uh, pawn b4. You so let's say white plays a3. Okay. Um, here, there's actually an interesting decision. Because black could play b4 immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it makes sense, uh, at least in the game, um, which I'll show. Black played bishop f5 first. Mm-hmm. Just to develop the bishop and make sure that, okay, before you break, you want to make sure that the pieces are optimized. Mm-hmm. Now, this did allow white to play rook c1 and stop this b4 break. But um, I think from this position, Black played some uh, some really nice positional moves and, and kind of balanced um, the strategy between restricting white and capitalizing on, on some targets. Mm. Um, so in this position, after rook c1, 
I want to ask you, like, what's your, what's the first move that comes to mind or what's like your first impression? If this were Blitz, what would you do? Sure. I feel like this, I would want my knight to go here. Mm hmm. This knight's blocking it. This is also a very good outpost for my other knight. Mm hmm. So somehow getting this, the, the knight on D2 off so my, uh, my knight can, can go here. Um, right. That might be hard to do. The okay. line of D2 is so solid, right? It is very solid. And then this knight can retake. They like support um, each other. Um, maybe even like just get rid of this bishop, maybe? Mm -hmm. Oh, Cause something like knight h5? Because this bishop is like going to be trapped. Interesting. Um, those are some of the things that come to mind immediately. But, oh, I'm trying to click out of this. Is it working for you? There. Um, oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I can still um, make this, so. Uh. So, I think you, yeah, you have some, some different ideas between all these knight moves. Um, the most normal move to play here, which you didn't mention. E5? E6. Oh, E6? Oh, sure. E5 is off limits. E6 is the most normal move. Yeah, if you want a complete <laughs> development. Okay, yeah. And that, uh, that was a boring answer. I was trying to find like a, you know, the tactic or something. Right. Now, E6 is actually not the best move. Oh. You have to be aware of what white wants to do. And we we'll also what? want to be aware, this this bishop is one of your strongest pieces. The fact that you're controlling this diagonal, Yeah. Uh, we'll see how it plays a role later on. But um, if you play E6, white's a move. White has a very strong positional move here. Yeah, knight h4, forcing the trade of knight for bishop. Ah, so the move might be something like this, to have a retreat square? So, yeah, h6. Um, so the game I'm showing you is a game between two grandmasters, um, Petkov against Nikolov, mm -hmm. and black played h6 here. Mm. High-level move. To prepare e6 to complete development and to preserve this uh, light squared bishop. Mm. Makes sense. So black isn't in too much rush. Yeah, I'm trying to be nope. fancy, but... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, it's a bit more positional, but uh, you want to um, at least be aware of these uh, these nuances. So after h6 was played, white actually does a very similar thing. White plays h3. Mm. Preparing, just creating loot for his own bishop. Yeah. Uh, so white plays bishop, or sorry, black plays e6. Bishop e2. And now, I think from this position, Black finds a, a really nice idea, probably the strongest idea in the position. And it's the beginning of um, not only improving one of the pieces, but targeting the weakest point in White's position. So first, I want you to identify what is, like, what is the main target you would like to focus on in the position. The weakest parts? Maybe like the, the back two pawns? Yeah, which pawn is weaker, g2 or b2? Uh, b2. Yeah, b2. Because it's hard for white to defend. Yes. But it's also hard for black to attack. Yes. However, it's possible for black to attack. And it that's sounds, what I want to find. It sounds like there's some kind of sacrifice where you push b5, b4 here. Mm. And then bringing your rook to the seven, to second rank. Yeah, you're trying to pull a Shabalov with this, uh, this epic yeah, yeah. break. But, uh, I mean, B4, uh, C take B4. Yeah, <laughs> night attack. <laughs> so, okay, it's something to consider. Okay, if the rook so, were still on A1, then B4 could be very much, uh, a strong move. So we could attack this. And but how, yeah, how within the next few moves could Black potentially attack B2? Um,. So I'm, I'll eliminate some options. Like this bishop can't attack that because right. it's different color. Um, you have to be a, a little bit imaginative here, but creative. Oh man! Like the okay, a rook has a hard time attacking it too. Yeah. Can a knight attack the pawn? Probably. How? But it's it's a weird weird path, I think. So what square 
like here? Yeah, so you want a knight to get to a4. If you can somehow magically just plop a knight on a4, b2 can't be defended. Okay, how do you get to a4? Oh, man. That's the next question. Uh-huh. There's no, <laughs> There's no good way, I don't think. Well, there was probably a way. Uh... You can get to a4 in three moves with, with one of your knights. Oh... Yes. Wow. So sometimes chess is about asking yourself the right questions and then figuring out the answers to those questions. Um, it's it's a difficult thought process, but the move that was played here, very strong move, knight d7. That's so weird. I, was, I would just play bishop e7, castle, and then figure it out. Right. <laughs> so black plays knight d7 right away because now white is under immediate pressure, even though... It still takes two moves to play knight a4. White has to do something about that. Yeah, and this bishop is really nice. And yeah, the the rook can't access c2 or b1. White can't play e4. So it's um it's a bit problematic for white. Mm. So okay, knight g7 was played. Uh g4, kicking the bishop. Bishop h7. Mm-hmm. And now, okay, white finds a resource, bishop to d1, um, trying to control the square. Um, so black continues, knight b6. And now black wants to, probably still wants to play knight a4. And the idea would be if bishop were to take on a4. Actually, we can imagine, let's say, uh, let's say white castles here. This wasn't played in the game. But if we imagine this happens, knight a4, bishop take a4, would black rather take with the pawn or the rook? I would... Naturally the pawn, but it sounds like the answer is the rook. Uh Aha. Um, I would actually think the pawn. Okay. Naturally I would think the pawn. Yeah, it's, it's natural and it's also, like... It also helps to realize the idea when you take with the pawn, you open up the B file slightly so your rook can come in. Got it. And now your knight won't be the one attacking the pawn, but the rook can now um, have access and you're still controlling these two squares. Got it, got it. So, okay, white kind of realized the danger and white played, oops, um, bishop to, okay, so castling wasn't played, bishop c2 was played. Um, now forcing the trade of bishops. Yeah. And now it actually seems like white is okay here. And that's one of the things I really like about this game, was white never fully became okay. Every time it seemed like white was hold, kind of holding on, like had this a3, c3 preventing b4, and now trades the bishops, black uh, kept finding additional resources. So after bishop c2, the bishops got traded. Mm-hmm. And now, uh, now this is a key moment. Uh, black to move. What would you do? Maybe push now because the back rank is empty. Yeah, B four. Very strong move. Wow, first one right today. Okay. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> the, the, the pawn is pinned to. In this case, the pawn is pinned to a square. Yeah. And uh, it's a very nice idea with the king still being on e1. So the a-pawn can't take. If the c-pawn takes, I would assume something like knight take b4 is going to be crushing. Mm-hmm. So the rook is uh, is essentially trapped. Like if rook, yeah, if rook c3, you have knight d3 and knight a4, and white's just falling apart. Yeah. So white's already in big trouble. Um, but white played uh, a move to attempt to resist white castled here. Now the question is, how would you continue as black? It's another nice guess the move moment. Make this a main line. Um, okay, I see you can win a pawn. Yeah, by taking on a3, right? Yeah, or even, yeah, take on a3, but that opens up the b file, and I think that gives some, some counterplay. That's true. Uh, the second thing that comes to mind is closing everything, but I'm not sure, not sure what that accomplishes after mm-hmm. this rook moves. Um, 
possibly taking on C3 and then playing Knight A4. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you, the... Yeah, you've identified like the three main options. Yeah. Like, you, you take either direction or you play B3. Yeah. This looks more promising, I feel like. Yeah, take on C3, rook takes C3, knight A4, rook C2. I mean, black has some nice pull in this position. I mean, you can continue with maybe B5. Yeah. Eventually B4. Um, but this is not the strongest continuation. Uh, so was it one of the three main moves? Yes. So what's really important is that you kind of, you find the follow-up um, to whatever move that you play. And the follow-up I don't think is that easy. Um, so you were exactly right. When you take on a3, you're yeah. giving you're giving white counterplay on the b file. Like when you win the pawn, whatever you take back with rook b1 is coming. This yeah. is very unpleasant given that your this rook is out of the game. So, um, so b3 was played. Huh. I remember when I first saw this game, I was I was slightly shocked given that b3 is usually a, a grave positional mistake for black, because black is closing down everything on the side where, I mean, he has a space advantage. Now it doesn't seem like there's any further break. Oh, I think I get it why. I think I see why. So how does black continue? This rook has to stay put, right? Mm-hmm. If, if knight a4? So knight a4. Rook b1. Yeah. Rook and this rook is just stuck here for until however long my knight's here. Yeah, that's that's true. Oh, take. Yeah, black sacrifices, given that there's overwhelming compensation. Wow! And then the pawn can threaten the push, and and then the, the yeah the massive pawn chain to connected pass pawns with a B pawn supporting behind. Um, you'll see how easy it was for Black to win after uh, after the peace sacrifice. Wow. But, um, but this was perhaps necessary to see Wow. back when Black played B3, was to identify, okay, this is the continuation. Wow. And this pawn's hanging too. And yeah, Black is actually winning three pawns for the, for the peace. And um, like White's Minor pieces are completely like doing nothing, just very much restricted. Yeah. Um, so the rest of the game, I just pasted it in. Let me change the name of this chapter. Petkov Nikola. Um, it was very nice for Black. Just uh, okay. First win the a3 pawn, and then push the queenside pawns. Rook a2, nice move. And Black was very patient too. Just castles. <laughs> like on move, on move twenty-seven. Time to castle. Uh, and then the pawns are just unstoppable. There's some saying like two pawns on the sixth rank are, are worth a rook. These pawns are pretty much worth a queen. Yeah, knight b3 was a nice finish. Okay, c1 is coming, and white black will at least be up a rook if not more. <laughs> um, so I like this game, because there is a lot of nice flow, again, but much more positional nature. That's so good. It's so, and, so high level. Wow. Yeah, and we can argue that, like, Black's, Black's flow started with Queen B6. Like, this was the first move seizing the initiative. Mm-hmm. And then every move after this was either a threat or some, like, very understandable positional move. Yeah. H6 was very important to understand because I think a lot of people would would play E6 and allow Knight H4. Yeah. Wow, this is is a great line. I've had this position before. Uh, Not (laughs) this, but like maybe move seven. Yeah, move after move seven. They take the queen. Like I've had that position. Yeah, it's a very, uh, very common structure for this opening. Mm. And understanding kind of the ideas with this structure will make you a, a much more powerful player in the middle game. Mm-hmm. Now that you kind of understand, like, okay, ideas of, of bringing the knight to a4, ideas of playing b4, longer-term ideas of sacrificing, um, preserving this bishop, lots of That's things great. have combined wow. together to uh, give black the advantage. Oh my gosh. So, 
It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a nice game. I, I only discovered this game like a few weeks ago. So. Dang, that's so deep. Wow. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, this is actually one game. I have, I have another study which I can, I can just send you a link to. It's a public study. It features this game. It features another game that I gave, uh, gave in the St. Louis lecture that, um, if you want to look at these lines further, uh, you can do so. I'll just share it in the, in this chat. Oh yeah. Is it the one against how to play against D4? Yes. Nice. I, I skimmed through it. But gotcha. cool. Oh, it's, it's, this a private study. Oh, wait, what? Oh, cause I didn't share the right one. It's, I, I shared like a cloned one. Let me go to the how to play. Sure, sure. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, after we talk about middle game, I would ask you, I would love to ask a quick question about openings as well. Yeah, of course. Uh, let me. Oh, wow, I'm of this. Here. There we go. Okay. Here's, uh, the actual one. Thank you. Yeah. So hit me, uh, you can hit me with your question. Yeah, well, I mean, I want to finish the middle game strategy first. Is this is this the game? Is, oh, I sure. Have I had one, one more game, game in mind. It was yeah. more. It's more of an exercise, which um, oh, this game too, actually. Uh, <laughs> so we have a couple of choices. Maybe we can look at this game because this will apply to your uh, the white side. Okay. Um, and this is a game I played. Hmm. Six months ago, seven months ago, it was part of a team tournament. I was playing like a 2100, mm -hmm. um, but I thought it demonstrated some nice, again, kind of along the themes of what we've been talking about, some nice restrictive play, and then it finished with some very nice attack. Mm -hmm. um, so it came from uh, Sicilian, where I didn't play open Sicilian. I actually tricked my opponent uh, into playing uh, a line that maybe he wasn't familiar with. Mm -hmm. Um, starting with knight c3. And this is something you could do, like if, cause you're playing close Sicilian, right? Or Grand Prix attack? Uh, yeah, I just got the book actually. I haven't read it yet, but ah, I just picked it up. That's awesome. Yeah, thank um, you. Um, so there's, there's lines in this. What would you play after knight c6? Just curious. Um, well, I, I watched a video. <laughs> yeah, okay, bishop to b5. So, um, sometimes what I like to do is play knight f3 first. Yeah. Which is, like, at the higher levels, it's a more reliable move. Mm -hmm. And it avoids these lines with bishop e5 and knight e4. And I did this because if black is very well prepared in these knight e4 lines, it should equalize. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just another option for white. If, if you do have trouble against a certain player, you can deviate with this. Sure, okay. Uh, but essentially, we got to this position where now I play bishop to b5. Hmm. And it is it is a bit tricky for black. Um, and the the best move for black is queen c7 to avoid these uh, double pawns. Mm -hmm. um, what my opponent did was a mistake. He played e6, which allows me to just take on, on c6. And this is a structure you could potentially get a lot um, in in this sort of opening, with black having these uh, these double pawns and then white trying to organize something on the king side. Yeah. Now I want to show you uh, just one cool line that let's say black plays knight d4 here. Uh, there's a really cool bit of preparation, starting with e5. And the idea is that okay, black will probably be inclined to take the bishop. White can take back. Most natural move for black is knight d5. And then it's kind of this weird position. And white has a really incredible move here. When I when I was looking up the opening, it was hard to believe that this move um, could be played and is like is it strong, but the move is knight g5. Kind of going against opening principles, but uh, having yeah. a very dangerous threat of either knight take f7 or queen f3. Mm. And it's actually not easy for black to defend against. Both, yeah. There's some line if if black plays e6, yeah, then I saw knight that. and the square is uh, in, is in white's full control. Oh, what about queen f3 there? Would that still work? No. Uh, queen f3 immediately. Yeah. 
Oh, the night is hanging. Oh, okay. So, um, but yeah, 94 right away, and 96 is unstoppable. Wow, that's so, fantastic. This is a cool bit of preparation that I, I've i never had in a tournament game, but I'm keeping in my back pocket. <laughs> it's so yeah. difficult for Black to find a move here. Yeah. I think the best move for Black is F6, which really says something about the position. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then White can still play Queen F3. And White just scores very, very well in this line. Mm -hmm. Got it. So what I want to yeah. focus on is this saved, by the way? I don't, I don't see it on the notation. Oh, yeah. So I've, I've hidden the moves because there are certain points I don't want you to see the next oh, move. Oh, makes but sense. All, like, everything is still there. So yeah. as I play through the moves, they'll show up. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Now, you should see the annotations. Um, I do not. I'm a oh, move. You do. But... I'll, I'll put in the annotations after the game. Okay, cool, yeah. cool. Um, okay, so E6. We'll go forward here. Um, normally, if you're a Grand Prix player and you can take on c6 like this, it's uh, it's already pretty pleasant. Mm. Um, I castle, should be seven. And now, White has a couple options. I'll just go ahead and say I play e5, which is a very strong like restrictive move, given that usually in the structure Black would like to someday play e5. Mm -hmm. But after White plays e5, this bishop is just stuck. Mm. really has no great way of developing. On top of this, I'm clearing the e4 square for my knight. Yeah. So I avoid any trade. And I just get some nice space advantage. Um, and the idea from this position is actually to play something like c4. And then b3, c3, and uh, if white gets a structure, like all of black's minor pieces are just restricted. Like the knight would have to retreat... This bishop is dead. This bishop is restricted by the pawn on e5. Mm -hmm. And then I can focus on the, the king side. Mm. Um, so a lot of these moves, I'll just show you what happened. d3, um, queen e2. I play queen e2 because I didn't want to deal with potential c4 ideas, which is maybe what black should have played earlier. Um, like even like in this position, black should have probably played c4. Maybe at some point sacking a pawn, but just to open up more lines for the the bishops. Yeah. Um, but okay, queen e2, queen c7, play c4, simply develop. And um, again, I was being very patient because black really has no active play. Like black wanted to play a4 and fight for some space, so I just stop him. Now the knight is completely restricted. Uh, he moves back to d7. And I was very happy to put this bishop on c3, mm -hmm. where it supports the pawn, and it also has some x-ray vision against the king's side. Yeah. Um, so, so far, like, up until this point, it was just about improving the, the pieces and, and restricting black. Um, but very soon, we'll see how white uh, initiates some attack, actually starting with the next move. Uh, white to move in this position, what would you consider playing? Wow, uh, I was looking at. I'm just looking at mo like moves that attack. Mm. So a sacrifice comes to mind. Sure. Uh, I want my queen to like come here. That's another idea. Uh, this wouldn't work. I would. I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Let's imagine this is like a real. A real game situation. Let's say it's, you're playing a classical game. Sure. You have a lot of time on your clock. Sure. Um, and you already, you're already spotting some options. Um, if you have enough time, the first thing that you want to start with is calculating knight f6. Yeah. By far the most forcing move. And okay. to calculate this move, it, it takes it takes some discipline in terms of being concrete and looking at if if you're coming on top in all the, the various options that black can play. Sure. So yeah, the question is, after knight f6, what is happening? I see, okay, g take f6, e take f6, bishop d6. Seems like the most natural line. How can white 
continue from that position. Yeah. Maybe queen to e4 to go to g4? Mm-hmm. Queen e4. So the king will probably move out. Mm-hmm. The queen will go to g4. Yeah. The rook will g8. go to g8. And black is ready to play rook g6 next move. So after queen e4, king h8, maybe queen g4 is not the best move. Maybe something else is the best move. Yeah, so this is where you want to maybe start looking for ways to deviate. Also keep searching for ideas. Um, now, when I got in this position in my game, yeah, I I was very much wrapped up in these lines with, with queen e4. Yeah threatening queen g4, and I was trying to figure out how to respond to king h8, rook g8, and rook g6. And then I took a step back. Mm. Sometimes you, you want to you want to pause in certain positions and look for different types of options. Um, it turns out after knight f6, g take f6, e take f6, bishop g6, there's another reasonable move white can consider, other than queen e4. Okay. Um, oh, this? Knight g5. Interesting. <laughs> I'm just yeah. trying to think of other moves, right? Um, Knight g5 is very interesting. Just have space for my queen to come. Yeah, because if queen, if pawn takes g5, then queen h5. Yeah. And queen h6, queen g7 looks pretty unstoppable. Yeah. Is that Unless, the line? <laughs> well, let's, let's calculate. Yeah. So let's play it out, but we'll play blindfold. Or we'll okay. play without moving the pieces. So you, sure. you play knight f6. Yes. G take f6. E takes f6. Bishop d6. Knight g5. H takes g5. Queen h5. Mm, rook to d8. Queen h6? Oh, bishop f8. Bishop f8. Oh, no. What else could you consider after rook d8? After, yeah, after rook d8. Um, oh, why not just take on g5? Yeah, that's another, like, main move. Um, then king f8. King f8. Queen g7 check. King e8. And you still have bishop, you still have bishop f8. Um. Right. So it gets fuzzy. Like, it, it's one of these situations, like, if you, if you can really dig through the forcing lines, then it might be worth investing the time to calculate. But it's sort of a judgment call if you go for knight f6. Or do you just enjoy your position given that, okay, everything is, is nice for white, why take the risk? Yeah, there's, there's very little risk. To, I mean, you have to be so precise in this to make it work, and you don't need to force it. Right. Okay. So it, it's, so... That makes, okay, so the higher level is just like, you can calculate all these lines, Pam, but, you know, why? Like, why like, is this the best... You see the time, or so it, it always depends on the situation. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you have to use intuition. In this case, when when I was playing this game, I, I probably took like at least fifteen minutes on the move because so I realized it was a very critical moment. If if the move is working, it's just winning, and I arrived at the conclusion that it's there's more than enough compensation, even if I if there's no immediate win. Oh. And all of these lines, black is very. Good very close to getting mated. Mm. And there's actually, uh, there's a line that might be even stronger than knight g5, which I want to point out. Sure. Um, so knight f6, g take f6, e take f6, bishop e5. You have a very good idea of cl clearing the path for the queen with this idea of knight g5. Mm -hmm. What's another move that you can consider basically with the same idea, but different square for the knight? H4? H4, what else? 
D4. D4, what else? D2. What else? E5? Yeah, E5. <laughs> um, knight E5 is just the most centralized square. And again, you're threatening mate in two with queen G4. Oh, interesting. And in, in similar lines where the rook comes to D8, your knight is just much better placed. Yeah, I, I, I assume that I don't have enough defenders for the two attackers, but I, I do. I, I see that now. Hmm. Um, well, you're not concerned. Let me, uh, let's go ahead and play this, uh, this line sure. here. Sure. Take, take, here, and then here. Um, oh, you're not I'm concerned sorry. about bishop take e5 because it's made in two. Oh, I see. Yeah. It looks clearer now, you know? <laughs> right, and this is one of those things, like, when it comes to attacking and, and actually crashing through, it helps to have, like, very strong visualization skills and the ability to identify... Uh, forcing moves and also identify all of your forcing options. 95 is a forcing move because you're threatening force mate. Mm -hmm. Any move that threatens force mate has to be considered. Um, in this case, black has like only one defense rook to it. And this is a line which, this is a critical line which if we play out, we can see white, uh, white is doing very well. With queen g4, king f8. Ah, so the knight controls f7 too. Yeah, so the knight targets f7. Now it's still a little bit tricky to win. And when I played this in in um, over the board, my calculation was queen g7, mm -hmm. king e8, and then queen g8, bishop f8, and then I just calculated rook e1. And I saw black is completely stuck. Mm. So this position, like this, this, it was just a completely forcing line, is what kind of allowed me to go into this line. And actually, I saw one thing further that um, even though black is stuck, I still need to make progress. So white's yeah. plan is bishop d2, bishop take h6, and queen f8 mate. Mm. And it's so hard for black to stop. All the black pieces are on the back rank. Because everything's stuck, and the queen is tied down to f7, so nothing can even develop to d7. Yeah. Wow. Um, now, actually, there, there's a stronger line after analyzing it with the engine. Sure. Uh, the engine well, question, with a very nice line. question before that. When you yeah. when you made the sacrifice, knight, knight f6, right? Um, yeah. Did you see bishop d2 takes bishop h6? To eventually win on F's. Yeah, so my calculation was, I'll just say the full line, try and yeah. follow along. My calculation was knight F6, G take F6, E take F6, mm -hmm. bishop D6, knight E5, rook D8, queen G4, king F8, queen G7, king E8, queen G8, bishop F8, rook E1, over defending the E5 pawn, mm -hmm. to allow the bishop to come back to D2 and take on H6. That was my full calculation. So you saw the bishop d2 take on h6. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That that's that's impressive. So yeah, it sounds impressive, but it was um like it was a completely forcing variation forcing until variation, yeah. until this moment where you have to like this moment with rook e1, you kind of realizing that black is completely restricted. Mm. Um, so it, it, and of course I had to find like some key moves. Like first I have to find knight f6, and then I have to find um. Uh, where do I have the line? I have to find this 95 move too, which was very important. Yeah. To block the bishop from potentially defending. Got it. So, just to illustrate one really nice line that the computer recommends. I don't have to play queen g7 here. I have bishop d2 immediately. Oh, wow. And if the knight is taken, then it's force mate. Really cool force mate. Bishop take h6. And, okay, this is something which, like, once you consider bishop d2, then it, it's possible to calculate queen to f7 and bishop f8. And queen e7 mate next move. Wow. So, um, after calculating all of this, there is still one more critical variation I had to calculate, which is king h8. Mm -hmm. Where he just doesn't take the knight. And this is... Um, Perhaps an easier 
line, given that, okay, I'm not even down a piece here. I can continue the initiative. Um, and I can actually make use of my not on F6. Uh, I think I'll go ahead and just show you how the game finished, because it, um, it was very direct. Queen E4, threatening mate. Yeah. <laughs> he still can't take the knight. Play G6. Now it's very weakening to H6. And again, it's um, maybe a little bit reminiscent of the Karyakin game where like all the opponent's pieces are out of play on one side. Mm -hmm. I'm having so much fun on the other side. Uh, Bishop D2. H6 can't really be defended. He played King G7. And now white to move, mate in, mate in a few. Find the force mates. Yeah, Bishop H6. Very nice. Wow. Is this how the game unfolded? And this is how it ended. Yeah, he just resigned after. Wow. Taking. Um, so, it, yeah, it took a long time to actually play Knight F6, but it was well worth the investment. And sometimes you have to make this judgment whether you invest the time to go, th like, look through these, these very complex lines mm -hmm. or you, you keep control. But in this case, there was just overwhelming initiative that mm -hmm. it worked out. That's incredible. Wow. So, yeah, it was a nice game. And it's <laughs> it's one of these things which is actually somewhat typical for this opening where if Black doesn't play the opening correctly, like even starting with E6, he put himself in a very difficult situation. Uh, like not understanding the opening nuances, allowing this capture. Mm, got it. And then his second mistake was probably allowing uh, or not playing C4 immediately. And then, then it was just a, a clamp on the on the position. Sure. Okay. Can you show? Or I I went backwards. Um, oh yeah. So uh, let me um, let me change the settings here. Thank you. Now oh, you I see, see it now. Yes. Awesome. Well. Ah, but this is uh, the main line. Wait a minute. What did I do? Oh, maybe oh, E six is the main line. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 9f6. I just have to find where the game actually ended. Play king h8. Oh, so this is the main line. Okay. Wow. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, if you have opening okay. questions, let me know. Yeah, uh, I, would, I have a, like, a really quick opening question. Um, I mean, I know we're. Uh, Closing out right now, um, but I kind of like I told you a lot while ago. I I love the openings that you recommended, like openings where a little bit more unconventional, like mm -hmm. people don't really know it, like kind of surprise sure. weapons. Um, I love those lines, and mm -hmm. I especially like the line. I especially like lines where there's very little draw potential. So the more wins or losses with black or white, like I'm like more drawn to them, which is why I okay. chose the Benoni, even nice. though. White usually scores more than that, and I'm curious if you had any other uh, opening recommendations that I could like, um, kind of like lean in and like kind of poke around and, and play around and see if it might be a good fit for like my style and like this what I'm looking for. Sure, I mean, any so when it comes to recommendations, I can give you recommendations for white. Like if you're playing e4, I can give you recommendations against all the different main defenses. Um, <laughs> Against D4, I can give you a recommendation apart from Benoni, mm. uh, which would be Budapest Gambit. Budapest. I don't know if you're familiar with Budapest. It's like e, it goes E5, right? Uh, yeah, D4. I can make a new chapter here just to show you. Yeah, maybe our next coaching session could be around like just openings and and tricky lines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That'd certainly. Be fantastic. Like Budapest is one thing. Yeah. Um, which I'm I'm very fond of. Now the thing is that it can be avoided by white. So if white plays knight of three, that's when you can switch to like Benoni or um, or even d5 if if uh, white is going for a London. Mm. But you don't know, right? So you just play you can just play d. I guess you. Can so play I would five. probably recommend c5. Yeah. Yeah. Then if white plays c3. This is a sign that white is going for a London. This is where you can play d5 and then try and get the same position, which I showed with that London game. Wow, everything transposes to each other. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of move order tricks when black is playing 
d4 on move one or knight f3 on move one um or d4 and then knight f3 okay nice so um and against e4 what you're playing sicilian i'm playing sicilian i'm playing knight or but Ooh, knight Orf. okay i'm very open to because like, it's still i, I don't want to play what everyone else plays you know because <laughs> Like the how you described the openings that you're the types of openings that you're looking for, I I don't recommend this to too many students, but maybe you'd be interested just having like a surprise weapon. Yeah. Of playing knight f6. This is a gambit line. This is called the Stafford Gambit. Okay. Knight h5, knight c6. Hmm. Uh, you give away a pawn straight away. This is a dubious opening, but I can't tell you how many games I've won straight from the opening with this. <laughs> because there's a ridiculous number of traps. Okay. So but I, I can't use it in a tournament, though, huh? <laughs> I probably wouldn't say use it, unless it's like a rapid tournament, then it, okay. I think it could be effective. Um, for for a classical tournament, if you want, like, another surprise weapon, I can also vouch for this line when I take e4. Oh, this is the one with the queen e2 line? Queen e2, queen e7. Yeah. It's also technically dubious, but a lot of players won't know it, and a lot of players will fall into one of two lines, either bishop f4, this is the main trap, where black wins the piece after f5. Yeah. I fell into this myself when I was 2300, so. Wow. Uh, or players will also play bishop b5, after which bishop d7 gives black a very reasonable position, because you're ready to castle and win back the pawn. Nice. Um, those would be the, like, the first things that come to mind for black. Sure. Uh, okay. For white. For white, it depends what you're, so you're playing e4. e4, yeah. Just to make note of, so white suggestions. Let me just go through all the defenses. So against e5, you're playing knight c3. The grand three, yeah. Pursue. Mm -hmm. um, against e5, you're playing this four knights. Four knights. I actually don't know what to do after a3. Like, <laughs> um, but I kind of just like you know the up. you know the center four trick, right? Yeah, that's the only trick I know. <laughs> but you also know d5, right? Uh, yeah, you taught me that line as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Those are the two main ones. Yeah. Um, there's a funny line if they play g6, you can play a uh, reverse Halloween's gambit with knight take e5. Hmm. Um, which is actually like it's somewhat sound, surprisingly. <laughs> this position. Somewhat sound. Yeah. Because black is committed to g6, so there's no knight g6. Mm -hmm. And if knight to c6, then uh, d5, and like if knight b8, there's e5. And if you look this position up in the masters database, like, like white white wins twice, and there's one draw, one wow. like, very high level play. So, okay. Um, so yeah, that's another trick. I mean, there's not much else black can do. If black plays like bishop e7, d6, or a6, you go for a d4. Oops, after uh, after a3. Oh really? Someone had bishop e7 against me, and I was like, uh, do I put bishop? Ah, so it's very important to know d4. D4. Because you got a four knight scotch where the bishop is on e7 rather than b4. Yeah. So this is uh, this is very nice for white. Got it. Okay, I'll look into that line for sure. Um, yeah, so I think e5 is good, because also if they play Petrov, you just play knight c3. You can transpose. Got it. Okay. Um, so there's other... So e6? The French, yeah. What do you play against French? Uh, something like this. Okay. Um, if you're playing knight c3, there's basically three things you have to be ready for. Knight f6, pawn take pawn, and bishop b4. Yeah. So this is, French is something I can give you a few like nice recommendations. Okay. Sweet. I'll be happy to show you next time. Yeah. Maybe our next one could be about openings, because yeah. it'd be cool to be prepared, you know, like, of all these different Certainly. Options. And, okay, this gives me a good idea of, of what I can show you next time, too, in terms of, okay, what what exactly to play against French. And Carol Khan would be like the last major opening. Sure, yeah. Uh, okay. But I'll, I'll give you your recommendations next time. I think that, that'll be good to uh, to look over. Yeah, and I'll look up these, like Budapest, the Stanford defense, and sure. the Fortnite Scotch. 
Yeah, with the Budapest, I gave a lecture. Let me see if I can find it. On St. Louis? Yeah, I think it was called, yeah, Rosen's Awesome Miniatures. Oh, I saw that, actually. I remember so that. I give, like, a few key lines in the Budapest in that lecture. Nice. Yeah, it looks like a fun opening. <laughs> I didn't know how sound it was, but... It, it's relatively sound. Like, okay, if you're playing a super GM, they might try and refute it, but yeah. at any other level, it's um, no, it's very playable. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm going to look yeah. more into this and just like, explore um, opening today. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Feel free to play around and, and yeah, experiment, in, especially in your online games, because that's how you can very quickly learn new things. <laughs> Sweet. All right. Thanks, Eric. Right. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Have a good day. Take care, Tam. Thank you. You too. See you next time. Thanks. Bye. Later.